Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, episode number 365, why you may want to stay on your antidepressant. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the things that I have learned and and enjoyed learning about working with Dr. Maupin and her staff at BioBalance Health is that they all work assiduously to maintain their knowledge base and grow it. They are, they're reading research about what they do and research about things that are connected to what they do that, that continues to, to come out. I mean, in our most recent episode, we discussed a research uh, program th- that JAMA just had an article about that changed 15 years of medical history and the way we understood a particular thing with regard to hormone replacement therapy. Today, we're talking about some research that we've recently found that asks us to re-examine the way we understand antidepressant medicine and the damage that continuing or recurring episodes of depression and epilepsy can do to the structure of the brain and how as that happens, it increases the sensitivity of the actual mechanics of the brain, mm-hmm. the structure of the brain, mm-hmm. to depressive episodes. And, and in the discussion, uh, which is called the kindled brain, the article that we read, the research that we read, uh, they talk about a concept called kindling that's evolved since the 1980s and 90s in psychiatry, psychology, and neurology, uh, neurobiology. Uh, the kindling concept is... Uh, basically the, you experience a trauma, you experience some event that causes you to be depressed, or you could experience a, an epileptic seizure. And for the purpose of the research, all of those are very similar in terms of the impact on the brain. So those experiences cause you, your body to have a flight or fight reaction. And that flight or fight reaction causes the brain to produce cortisol. Well, your adrenals produce cortisol Ad- and adrenal. it affects the brain. Yes. So you get, a, you get a cortisol surge, which helps you in a more immediate moment of trauma to be able to survive. And it's called the flight or fight defense mechanism. Then it goes away when the event goes away. You, the, the, the frightening person is not there anymore. Uh, you, the wreck is over and you've lived through it. Uh, the depression is over. The depression is over. The the epileptic seizure is over. Mm-hmm. So, so then the question becomes, hmm, will that happen to me again? And w- will I ever have another automobile accident? Maybe, maybe I won't or maybe won't nearly have another automobile accident. So I probably won't have another episode of this. But what the research is showing is that trauma can cause you to learn to expect this to happen, to to or to to be more likely to happen. Facilitate it's happening. It's, you're more it, it sensitive more to that. Lower levels of the stressor can cause the same stress reaction. Right. And and this means that if you have depression, if you have epilepsy, if you have post-traumatic stress, yeah. which we treat with antidepressants, then it is beneficial and helpful for you to continue a medication that would keep you from getting recurrences. In other words, most of my patients... When they're depressed, they take an antidepressant. When they're not depressed, their doctors, excuse me, wean them off of that. Right. And so then they they stop it. So, so this challenges how we treat. I've thought about depression. De- treating depression or yes. epi- epilepsy is a little different. They usually leave epileptics on the medication. Right. The reason being that the more episodes they believe, the more episodes you have, that means that the more severe they will be and it'll take less of a trigger to get the next one. So if we can keep somebody on an antidepressant and keep their brain from becoming depressed, then we will not have the same, same severity 
rolling down the hill, getting worse and worse like a snowball so, as we go. So this research has an application for your practice of mm-hmm. biobalance health, which is why we began to have this conversation. Because historically, what you've said to people and what I've said to people is if you have a, an event caused depression, mm-hmm. it's not a, a, a biologically caused depression. Mm-hmm. If you have an event caused depression, your mother dies and you're depressed, mm-hmm. then you may want to take an antidepressant. But you can probably come off of it in about six months. Mm -hmm. Many people do. Mm -hmm. Maybe most people do. You treat people with testosterone, which can have uh, a positive effect on preventing depressive episodes. For for patients who uh, have had a new onset of depression Mm -hmm. at about the same time as their testosterone stopped or decreased, 35 and over, it's not the same thing as somebody who's had a depression their whole lives, but it's for, for somebody who has had depression or post-traumatic stress episodes since they were 35, it's likely that the drop in testosterone was the trigger that made their depression Occur. come on mm-hmm. because it, it, it basically lowered the fence and allowed small events to make the depression happen or these other, these other outcomes. So, I tell them testosterone is an antidepressant. It really is. And so is thyroid. So if I have to treat them with thyroid or testosterone, that once we get them on a good dose, which means at least two insertions of uh, pellets, four to six months or four to eight months. So then they can see how they feel. Do they feel good? Do they feel bad? And then they go to their psychiatrist. And they discuss it with the doctor that's prescribed. Right. Psychiatrist or their primary care. Right. And then... They decide whether they can wean down on the drug. And either they can wean, many of my patients have successfully weaned down to a very low dose, and some people have come off their antidepressants, but that's not as common as weaning down to a very low dose. Well, the one thing that you are pretty aggressive about saying is don't decide on your own right. to come off of one of these medicines. Yeah. So just decide, well, you know what? It's been six months. I should be better. I'm going to quit taking it. There's a rebound. There's After you've been on these, yeah, it's like a yeah. withdrawal, but you basically get the depression back in spades, basically. Mm-hmm. It's it's huge. So we don't want that to happen. And there's a lot of side effects with just stopping these medications. Right. Physiological so, side. Physiologic side. Yeah. So this wasn't really in this article, but this is our statement that we try to get people off antidepressants in general if we can, but but we use their primary care or their psychiatrist to, to help us. Mm-hmm. But... This article kind of made me think that if they've had a lot of episodes of depression, the more they've had, the more likely they the should more just likely stay on they it. should just stay on it, and or the and, more intense it was. But if they feel great on testosterone and thyroid, mm-hmm. then there's still a chance they could go down to a tiny dose mm-hmm. that would just be enough to you know all three things together would be enough to keep them from getting uh, another episode. So what you want to do is avoid the tipping point. And, mm-hmm. and if a low-dose maintenance dose of an antidepressant can prevent you from finding the tipping point and going into another deep depression, mm-hmm. which limits your ability to function and impacts your ability to survive, then perhaps you ought to stay on that. And that's new mm-hmm. thinking for you. That's what mm-hmm. the, the new research is valid for you and important to you because what it's it's making you do is revisit the messaging that you right. give to your clients. Right. And I and and I certainly don't want to cause any harm mm-hmm. because this actually this theory, it is a theory about the the depression getting worse with each episode. Well, but I asked my psychiatrist friend mm-hmm. who uh, I said, does this really happen? Yeah. And he goes, yeah, let me see that article. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he said that is what happens. Mm-hmm. It gets worse and worse and worse with each episode. So that's why he wants to keep people on antidepressants. You get you your body learns to experience the depression more frequently for less reason. Right. And, and the the new experiences don't build to a severity. They start at a severe point. Mm -hmm. And so it gets worse. And that's, that's new thinking about the way we treat depression. Right. Cause we usually do it episodically. And many people we give, we prefer to think of it that way. Now, now I have to say, I'm going to step back and say here that if you're on an antidepressant for the loss of your mother or for the loss of your child or some 
horrible Worthy. event that I can't even think about. Right. That um, that that is not because you're depressed. You're a depressed person. It's because that that event was so severe that it created Absolutely. a depression, and that's reasonable. Right. And mourning is part, seems to be depression many times. So you, you have to to survive and work and function. Many people have to take an antidepressant. That isn't a forever deal. That isn't well, like what we're talking about. We're, t- we're talking more about um, childhood damage that surfaces itself, like PTSD. That's different than when we're adults and we have to go through stress. It, it patterns our brain differently. Or depression that we inherited the risk for depression. Many people in our family had it. Genetic. Genetically. Genetically. Mm-hmm. And so that makes that makes that bar that we or, or that we're goes down trauma family. Right. Right. Yeah. Or al- alcoholic families often mm-hmm. have that. So 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 all of those types of patients or people we're talking about are these are, are people that are in this study. Mm-hmm. They're people who have the risk for it and have had multiple incidences. Right. Now my patients, I have to evaluate them. Did they have this or PTSD early? Mm-hmm. That's different than the patients that just start getting depressed when their testosterone drops. Well, the way I, I was taught and understood it was that you that depression, clinical depression, clinical levels of depression that inhibit your functionality, your energy, your mood, your lightness, your, your ability to sleep, you know, everything, uh, all of that. Yes can happen either exogenously, which means there's an outside event. You lose a job, you break up with a girlfriend, a parent dies, you uh, get a huge financial blow of some kind. I mean, any uh, your cat dies and you're depressed. It's, it's traumatic for you. Mm-hmm. That's exogenously caused depression. If that is deep enough and severe enough, it can cause your brain chemistry to reset. Then it becomes an endogenous depression. Mm-hmm. You can also just become depressed because you have the genetic predisposition and the brain chemistry mm-hmm. is working that way and you become severely You were born clinical with not depressed. enough serotonin, basically. Basically, yes. Yeah. And so they pres- prescribe therapy, talk therapy, and medical therapy, a- antidepressants. Mm-hmm. The research shows that both elements can be helpful. Mm-hmm. One is not automatically or necessarily better than the other. So you, you may need to consider if you're seeing a therapist, continue seeing the therapist or starting to see a therapist, mm-hmm. even as you take an antidepressant, because you need to cognitively, cognitively refer, retrain your brain and you need to reset your brain chemistry. And, and I never really thought about it as a physical changing of the pathway of your brain. Mm-hmm. I always thought of it as kind of an overall in one part of your brain, you had more of this neurotransmitter or this chemical, but it is actually, there's pathways in your brain that you develop over time as you grow up. And, and these pathways, when you go through a depression, you, you don't follow your normal pathway. Your brain follows a different pathway. And that pathway, the more times you're depressed or the longer or the severity of your depression, it is easier for you to fall into depression than it is for you to be normal. So it's actually a physical change in your brain. The anatomy has changed. Mm-hmm. And they also went through, they, they went through the physical changes of your brain. Lots of episodes of depression or lots of episodes of PTSD or epilepsy that's untreated can make your brain shrink. It, it makes the hippocampus, which is the area of changing recent memory into long-term memory, and uh, and some emotions and spatial uh, spatial um, like looking at an architectural plan and seeing a building that kind of thing it, it makes that shrink the most and then so your whole brain shrinks your hippocampus shrinks your thinking is not as good so when I when I think of that and I think about hmm if I were having multiple bouts of depression. It's not just about the depression. It's about my brain changing its whole structure Mm -hmm. and making me more likely not to be able to think as well, Mm -hmm. which scares the heck out of me. Sure. So that should scare the heck out of most people. And I have that fear as I age. And I've Mm -hmm. talked to a lot of people who 
similarly have that fear as they age. Mm -hmm. Am I becoming less sharp? Do I have less capacity to think and mm -hmm. problem solve? Can I remember the things that I need to remember mm -hmm. on demand? Right. The way and I was always used to. Aging have. can make your brain shrink all on its own. Uh -huh. And aging without estrogen, they've done several studies on this, show that if 10 years after menopause in women, if you don't have estrogen, that your brain is much smaller than the people that do take estrogen. So that's that doesn't mean... You can't think because your brain's smaller. It just means that it's it's not repairing itself. It's not it's not growing. So, so this article talks about two concepts that I want you to explain relative to the hippocampus. One is the impact of cortisol, mm -hmm. and one is something called BNDF. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about both of those? Yes, I'll talk about cortisol first because I know the most about cortisol and everyone knows the most about cortisol. Okay. Cortisol's um, when you're stressed, cortisol is secreted immediately. Your brain stimulates your adrenal gland to secrete cortisol. It goes everywhere and it penetrates the blood brain barrier and goes into your brain. Okay. So with cortisol. So your brain is saturated or flooded with flooded cortisol. Flooded with cortisol. Okay. So when that happens, cortisol is. Um, a catabolic hormone. That means it breaks tissue down. What it does for fight or flight is it takes all your tissues, your muscles, unfortunately not your fat as much, but your muscles, your brain, all your, your important tissues that keep you healthy, it breaks it down and makes energy out of it. And that includes the brain. So when you're running, you're breaking down from an animal or something that's stressing you. You, you are you are actually using, eating up your own body to, to give the enough energy to run. To and increase the likelihood that you can survive the moment. Right. If the fire and alarm in your building goes off, if uh, you, you hear a police siren behind you suddenly and an ambulance is coming by and you have to move quickly, the cortisol flooding your brain is what surges all your muscles, your, your sight, your hearing, everything uh, attenuates so that you can respond. But it also more makes quickly. all your muscles break down so they can make glycogen. I mean, and make li your liver puts out sugar and your. Well, that's and, the after effect. But this, no, it does it while you're, so you can have enough energy to run. Okay. It does it right then. That's what cortisol does is, I mean, there's so many things that it does, but in the brain, it actually uses your brain tissue for energy. And mm. when you have multiple episodes of depression, which is stress, mm -hmm. when it's untreated, you're actually using up your brain and you're, you are right. the shrinking cortisol. the yeah. brain. You're no longer making brain tissue. You're breaking it down. So the more of these episodes that you have, it's worse on your brain. Now, testosterone is the opposite hormone. Okay. Testosterone builds your brain back up, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why people can think better so when they're on testosterone. The function of testosterone is to regulate the balance between testosterone and cortisol. No, testos restore. testosterone doesn't balance out with cortisol. Testosterone survives it. Testosterone is there to rebuild the muscle and rebuild the brain when the cortisol goes down. Okay, because so, the cortisol is supposed to come in waves. It's, an, it's you're not supposed to always be flooded with cortisol. Right. We were we were supposed That's PTSD. to be right. Yeah. Right. We were we are we're supposed to be, you know, running after animals. You know, once a week, kill, you know, killing an animal. You know, <laughs> you know that kind of stuff. Having that kind of stress, but not the constant stress that we have every time the phone rings and every time we, you know, we have something bad happen in our lives, IRS calls, whatever it, we weren't supposed to have co a constant flow of stress. Yeah. And that's the part that, I mean, even in daily life without depression, you can be overusing your brain and flooding it with cortisol. Right. But especially we're talking, if you have a trauma history. Yeah. If you're, but we're talking about, P we're talking about PTSD constant and that's right. a constant cortisol. Right. We're talking about untreated depression, which is, a constant cortisol uh, flow. And we're, we're also talking about seizures, which is a different kind of thing, but seizures also stimulate cortisol because it's, it's a stress of your body. There's an overreaction to things. So, so it is a cortisol problem and that's why your, your brain is shrinking. But if you go on an antidepressant when you're depressed and you stay on it for three years, you can build your brain back. The, That's the what research they shows found. that, the, the, and this is where you get to, into the BNDF. Right. You need to talk about what that is. So BNDF is the brain, I have to, neurotropic 
um, what's the D? Brain derived neurotrophic factors. So testosterone actually stimulates BNDF, or that's what we think, because that is actually a it's chemical. It's like the fertilizer that makes the brain cells grow. Right. And right. cortisol can kill them. Yeah, kill them. And testosterone stimulates the growth of, of uh, muscle and brain in multiple ways, but I, I, I'm going to suggest that it's probably working through the brain derived neuro, uh, neurotropic factor, right. BNDF. Right or BDNF. So that is the factor that the brain makes itself and it makes more of when there is, there is no cortisol or there's low cortisol, normal levels, and it makes less when your cortisol is high. So the, the fertilizer goes away when you've got too much cortisol. Right. So that's really, I don't know much more than that, and I don't think they do. Uh, they're, they're, this is a new kind of neurotransmitter, at least to me. I haven't been, I've been reading neurology texts, and I haven't had a lot, of, a lot of information on that. But the reason all this has come together is that a lot of people in the fields of neuroanatomy, uh, neuropsychology, physiology, are, are beginning to say, if we provide and stay on antidepressants for perhaps the rest of your life and, and, and change the thought that we used to have of if this is an exogenously caused depression, in a matter of months, you can come off of it. You probably never need to take it again. Mm -hmm. and what they're saying is that they don't agree with that anymore for, for these reasons. Mm -hmm. for the, here's the chemical explanation, mm -hmm. the science explanation, but the, the take-home summary is that in the past 15 years, if you had an episode of severe clinical depression that was caused by some event, basically you were tossing the dice. We don't think you're going to have another one. We don't think you're going to have very many more. But there's always the likelihood, once you've experienced clinical depression, that you can have another clinical depression, mm -hmm. another episode of it. Mm -hmm. The research has begun to show that you are actually more likely to have additional episodes of it mm -hmm. because the experience of it changes your brain pathways and changes the way that your brain functions. If you are traumatized by some event that's significant enough to cause you to be clinically depressed, there actually is an increased likelihood down the road than we used to think that you'll have another episode of that. And it won't take as, it won't take the same level of trigger. It won't take the same trigger. Some other similar closely related trigger, smaller in stimulus, can cause the same depressive reaction, mm -hmm. which is why they're saying, because of the way that then starts to change the way your brain survives, uh, brain cells live and die, mm -hmm. grow, replace, that you ought to be on an antidepressant or consider being on a present, maybe indefinitely mm -hmm. for, for perhaps the rest of your life. Uh, and I think that, yeah. and continue therapy and continue your hormones mm -hmm. because the hormones help your brain grow back mm -hmm. your testosterone, your estrogen. And so does the therapy. And so does therapy and therapy actually works. I mean, they proved that therapy yeah. actually works like an antidepressant on your brain. So all that talk therapy that people go, Oh, that doesn't work. It does work. Yeah. It does work, and 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 it's what I believe. I believe it too. I mean, we know people who've role played and and role play into a different role, and well, it's a kind of make a terrible situation. Yeah, it's a yeah. type of therapy. Make a terrible situation better in your mind. Make a new pathway. So that does work, and that many of these things that we've always gone, ooh, we don't know how it works, so it must not work. We're they do. How. So, so <laughs> they do. Some therapy terms that you should probably be aware of. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, reality testing, uh, dialectical behavior Why don't therapy. You define them. <laughs> that would help in, me. <laughs> in lump sum, what they all do is teach you to think differently about a set of experiences and to retrain yourself so that the same originating stimuli doesn't cause the same response. Right. It's not like a Pavlovian, uh, you know, the bell rings, the dog salivates kind of mm -hmm. conditioned response. You can relearn how to interpret reality. You can mm -hmm. relearn how to interpret a set of events so that when you encounter those events again, you don't have the trauma reaction to them. Right. You don't have the depression to them. Or the anxiety. Or the anxiety, which mm -hmm. is all part of the trauma mm -hmm. reaction. So, you know, one of the questions as we were discussing this that came up in our discussion was, well, is, is that possibly why people who are abused continually get themselves in relationships with other people who will abuse them. And they, you know, it's like same 
a different guy, same stuff, mm -hmm. different <laughs> job, same boss. And that the answer we think is yes. Mm -hmm. Your brain trains itself to recognize these environmental cues and respond to them that way with the, the way of being the abused victim or of having a depression or an anxiety that you can't control. So you have to retrain that. You have to teach yourself mm -hmm. or be taught or be taught uh, how to see it differently mm -hmm. and respond to it differently. And it's possible. It can work. Yeah. So that's, I mean, I think you need both. So end of the day, stay on your antidepressant or at least discuss that with the prescribing physician. What if I stay on this on a low dose as a maintenance dose indefinitely and continue to get cognitive therapy, uh, dialectical therapy, uh, or reality testing therapy. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.